that we all live in a good way and uh, that all of these uh, Frenchmen and Anishinaabe, that's what we call ourselves, and uh, live in peace. There's a couple ways to say peace. You can say Wanakiwin, or you can say Bisaniwin. And so that's what will start things off in a good way. So. <laughs> We're time Bonjour, traveling. ladies and gentlemen. Bonjour. My name is Bonjour. Joseph Nicolet. And on August 16th, 1836, I arrived here 175 years ago. The question that I have to ask is this. Why was I here? <laughs> As you can see, I am not Ojibwe. I am not American. I come from another country. Can someone guess what country I come from? No. I am from France. Oh, wonderful. It's a beautiful country. And I was born in 1786, where I received a very, very good education. I studied mathematics. I studied uh, science. And then, ladies and gentlemen, I worked in the most important job in the world. Anyone guess what is the most important job in the world? I was a teacher, yes! Well done, are you a teacher? Are there any other teachers here? Yes, all right, the teachers, where you keep your hands up. I would like everyone to face a teacher. I would like you all to wave to these teachers. Everyone wave to the teachers. And I would like you all to say, thank you, teacher. Thank you, teacher. The most important job in the world, because I was a professor. I studied math, I taught mathematics and science. And uh, I don't know if it is the same today, but I was not making a lot of money as a teacher. Oh, so, so I decided that I would use my mathematical skills. And I got a little big in the head. I, I thought that I could make uh, use mathematical probabilities to uh, predict the French stock market. <laughs> as, as we all know, the markets, they are rational, are they not? They are very rational. So I started making predictions in the stock market and I started making money. And my friends, they were very excited. So I started investing money with my friends and we were all making money. Until the year 1830, when there was a little revolution and the stock market had crashed, I lost all of my money, I lost all of my friends' money, and then I lost all of my friends. <laughs> and I was poor, I was despised by my former friends and humiliated, so I emigrated to America in 1832. Mm. Not knowing no one, basically penniless. And when I arrived in America, there were only 24 states. And in the western re regions, there was not a lot of information. The maps there were not very, very good. And of course, there were no uh, fancy automobiles, there were no trains. So what do you think was the fastest way to get around the United States in 1832? Yeah, and what was the fastest mode of transportation? Boats. A boat, yes. Steamboats. So the rivers and the lakes, they were very important. And uh, speaking of rivers, uh, could someone raise their hand? Uh, just tell me, what do you think is the biggest river system in the United States? <laughs> the Mississippi. And what does the Mississippi mean again? Mississippi. It means uh, great river. It means great river. That's an Ojibwe word. It is an Ojibwe word. It means great river. And they are very right. It is a huge river. It was a major freeway. Now, when I had arrived here, I wanted to be remembered by my newfound country, and I wanted to, I wanted to well, reinvent myself. So I asked myself two very important questions. The first question I asked myself was, Nicolet, what are your skills? What are you good at? Can someone here tell me a skill that they are good at that they would like to be remembered for? What does someone have a skill here? You must, someone here must have a skill. <laughs> July 29th. And I finished uh, September 21st, I believe is what it was. So it was a little around two months on this journey, yes. And I finished my map, this map, when I was 43. So I was 57 years old. And right after I finished my map, I died. I had, uh, <laughs> I finished my map and I died. I had, uh, they believe it was stomach cancer. And I had a very sensitive stomach, and I have to say, one of my, I, in my journal, I already mentioned my favorite food was manoma, because it was very, very easy on my very sensitive stomach. So if you have a sensitive stomach, I recommend manoma, wild rice. It is very, very good for sensitive stomachs. How much did they pay you for your map? I am not sure how much I actually paid for it. I do not know why I shall have to find out. <laughs> Were you with trappers? 
I was mainly with them. Um, I was with the. Uh, they were they were fur traders, Mr. Brunet and Desiree. Um, and then when I when I went on my other expeditions, I was with the army. A lot of uh, the, the Lieutenant Fremont. Uh, Fremont is uh, Avenue. That's yeah. the name after him. So I was with the military as well when I went. Do you know how many, about how many beaver pelts it would take to dig two tons? I do not know. I am not skilled in that. I do know that uh, estimated for a beaver felt hat, which was the main industry uh, that came out of the main money maker uh, in before timber and all of that. That was the first one for for the settlers. A top hat, fur line top hat, was around, I think it was $60 at that time. So put that in, it was around a th over $1,000 for a hat. Just to give you an idea of how expensive those hats are. And that was like the convertible of today. If you had a big top hat, you had, that was a status symbol. Yes. You know, when Nicolet Avenue became Nicolet, that was the I, I do not know. It must have been so, so British. Um, but yeah, we also took a day and went out with the metal detector as well to see if we could find any metal that could probably be from like, you know, the French fur trading period or an earlier kind of site. And we actually ended up finding a musket ball, which was pretty interesting. And an axe head, but it was, I think, just a more modern episode. But it actually kind of, it was cool to, to find that part of it. Um, but yeah. If I remember, it might have been built in the 1950s, and by the late 80s, it was in pretty bad shape, needed replacing. So when that started working on plans to put, put a new bridge in there. And as part of their development process, they would routinely have archeologists go out and do a survey of areas that are going to be disturbed by highway construction. So a bunch of archaeologists came up here to do that for the new Highway 6 bridge. And what they did was dig shovel tests, like Jessica mentioned, smaller holes that you can dig fairly quickly. And it's just sort of a presence-absence kind of thing. You find artifacts or you don't. They started finding artifacts. So they decided to do a little more in-depth investigation, so they laid out a couple of the one meter square excavation units to look at a little bigger area. You also dig it in a little more controlled fashion so you can tell where the artifacts are vertically in relationship to one another, and they kept finding artifacts. So. It was decided, that, so of course there had to be a lot of conversation with MnDOT to make this decision, but when you've got an archeological site that's within an area that's gonna be disturbed by construction, you wanna look at several different options to try to avoid losing the information that's in that site. And one of the options you always wanna talk about is can we change the project and avoid the site? Well, there aren't too many options here. The bridge pretty much has to go there. You know, otherwise they would have to do a major realignment of the highway and everything else. So they decide, no, we can't really avoid the site. The bridge has to go where it is. What's another option? Um, another option is doing what's called mitigation or data recovery, where archeologists come in and do a large area excavation, recover the information that's in the site before it gets lost during the construction project. And that's what happened in 1993. A crew of archaeologists from a private firm came up here, and I think they were here in the fall, summer and fall, I believe, um, dug an area of 57 square meters, which I think works out to something in the neighborhood of 500 square feet. So it's a pretty big area that they excavated. And they found large quantities of artifacts. If you haven't stopped in Land Lakes Marine, there's a display in there with some of the artifacts that were found at the site in 1993. Interesting variety of artifacts that indicated that people had lived at that site at a number of different time periods. 